The Roman Empire was massive, and it became this big through conquest. But conquest was much more than supremacy in war. Annexing a new territory and submitting a new population to your rule only required enough military might at first. But to keep this territory, you had to make your subjects few Roman. Simply stamping out the old ways of the local populations and enforcing your ways was a recipe for disaster. You had to mix them with your own people, make them at least partly adopt your customs, copy your institutions. You had to Romanize them. Rome had a series of tricks up their sleeve when it came to absorbing new subjects, and it included the Romanization of foreign people's coinage. Today, let's explore how Romanization worked, how Rome integrated new territories to its empire, and see how, as this process occurred, the old native coinage slowly and steadily became something new, something Roman, often with a flavor of its old native style. Let's get started. Acculturation, and in case of the Romans, Romanization, started with the upper echelons of the newly conquered society. Instead of immediately installing a new government in Roman fashion and putting the region in charge of some powerful senatorial administrator, local elites who sympathized with Rome, Roman rule were put in charge, giving at least an impression that the conquered people were still ruling their own land. These elites were introduced to a more Romanized way of life and how to govern themselves, with their sons and daughters often being sent to Rome to be educated in Roman fashion and acquire Roman values. Generally not willingly, mind you, they were hostages rather than guests. This initial stage of Romanization basically served to forge a new government that could receive instructions from the central administration at Rome and carry out edicts, provide the taxes they were supposed to provide, and put in place the system of Roman laws that made these areas somewhat controllable. Roman imperialism was quite different to what most people think of imperialism. The concept of imperialism most of us learn in high school is that of the 18th, 19th century. When we think about the British Empire, for example, this was an institution that pushed for a high degree of homogeneity between metropolis and colony. If we, let's take an example, if we take India as an example, during English rule, new buildings had a strong English influence in them, the English language was thought to all levels of society, railroads were built, a unified monetary system more in line with the English standard was implemented, modern empires molded its colonies to be somewhat monocultural with them. Rome's efforts into establishing a monocultural society throughout its massive empire was mostly a, let's say, a crust. It focused on the elites, and depending on the province, more or less of this new cultural influence seeped down to the lower levels of society. It's better that I elaborate into a couple of examples. For the common folk, things were always rather different. There doesn't seem to have been any active efforts from Rome to transform a conquered people into new Romans, but some of their policies regarding newly acquired territories led to a mingling between the local culture and Roman culture. For example, retired legionaries were given lands and asked to found new cities in conquered regions. These new cities, coloniae, were in a way mini-Romes, ruled in similar fashion to the cities back in Italy. This, of course, led to a direct contact between the locals and the, let's say, average Romans settling their land. Some areas like Hispania, for example, were strongly Romanized in all levels of society this way. Other areas retain more of their original character. The Greek world at the Eastern Mediterranean is a good example of partial Romanization. Government institutions and the elites were Romanized to an extent in these areas. The way cities uh, were built took a more Roman character to them, like the organization of the streets and all of this, even though the way Romans and Greeks planned their cities in the first place did not differ much, but the common people retained much of their original local customs. The Greek language, for example, kept being used, with Latin serving as a secondary lingua franca. The local culture was also left relatively untouched, with institutions such as the Olympic Games being highly encouraged by Roman emperors. 
in some other areas, one would have had a hard time distinguishing any typical Roman institutions, almost like Roman wasn't even in charge. Egypt is a fascinating example. Roman emperors were shown in art the same way the old native pharaohs were depicted, from statues of Emperor Augustus showing him as an Egyptian god, to Emperor Trajan being shown on temple carvings as a pharaoh making offerings to Egyptian gods. Rich Roman citizens, for example, were mummified, given rise to the famous Fayum mummies, traditional native Egyptian language such as Coptic and Demotic, kept being used alongside Greek and Latin, and the administrative system organized by the Ptolemaic dynasties before the arrival of Rome was mostly kept intact. Egypt was still very much in control by Rome, its grain shipments were of vital importance to Rome, and the provinces the province was highly profitable for the Roman treasury, but for someone born and raised in Roman Egypt, to go to Rome for the first time must have felt like going to a almost completely different civilization, even if you were visiting your quote-unquote capital. A similar process happened with coins. Rome came across many monetized societies. In fact, many of these conquered peoples made beautiful coins back when Romans were still trading shapeless blobs of bronze. An Athenian must have scoffed at Rome's first coins, which were made so Rome could trade with Greek merchants. Just like Rome tried to acculturate the elites of its subjects, coins were equally heavily Romanized. They were tools of power, ways of telling to the common people who was in charge. Rome's pragmatism when acculturating foreign coins was very well thought out. A silver denarius from any central imperial mint was a universal coin. You could take a bag full of denarii to any corner of the empire and it would have been valuable. Maybe in some regions you would have had to trade them for local silver issues, but to have a bag of denarii with you meant you had good money. As for local issues, Rome understood that fully replacing monetary systems that were already in place, some for centuries, just to impose their imperial standard, would be very troublesome for the local economy. So Rome kept the local denominations, but changed the iconography on the coins to pass its own message of sovereignty. The best way to illustrate this is to show some examples of Romanization of coins. Let's head to the Iberian Peninsula, where the Celtiberian peoples were already monetized when Rome started taking over the region in the 2nd century BC. Trade with the Carthaginians from North Africa, the Greeks from the northeast of the peninsula, and Rome through sea trade brought the concept of coins to the Celtiberians. Here we have a silver unit issued in the Iberian city of Bolscan. This example was most likely issued between 150 and 100 BC, when the people from this area were already under Roman rule. And look how similar this coin is to a Republican denarius. Contemporary Roman sources, talking about the conquest of Hispania, mention a certain Argentum Oscense, silver from Osca, which could very well be this type of coin, issued as payment of tribute or as payment for auxiliary troops fighting alongside the Romans. So, on the obverse of this coin, we have a male head looking right a design commonly th seen throughout a series of cities in eastern Hispania. This, this did not indicate a political unity between the different tribes of the region. It was more of a common design used for the sake of familiarity. In the first century BC, a rebel Roman general, Quintus Sertorius, took control of Hispania and established Bolscan as his base. And look how interesting, a Roman general issued big numbers of coins similar to this one as payment for his rebel troops, showing this type of coin had become a clear reference in the peninsula for a high quality coin, good enough to be used as payment for his troops and substitute the denarius. On the reverse, we have a horseman galloping to the right, holding his spear, and <laughs> look how interesting, here we have legends in Iberian script. Despite being under Roman control, it could have been that during that time Romanization of the region wasn't very well developed, so we still find a design that is purely native to the Celtiberians. The legends read Boluscan, the name of the city where this was minted. Other tribes also issued denarii such as this one, putting their own little names in this area. Ok, let's jump ahead 100 years or so, and we find this coin, struck in the same city. It's quite worn, so the drawings on the right side of the screen will help us. 
The obverse of this denarius, struck in 39 BC under Domitius Calvinus, a governor sent to Hispania by Octavian, mix the old native style with the male head with Latin legends. The city, now thoroughly Romanized, had been renamed Osca, as we can see on the left part of the design. As a little curiosity, this city still exists, and it's called Huesca, a clear evolution of its ancient name. On the reverse, we have a change in design. Now the horseman is gone, replaced by a fully Roman design. Domitius was part of the Caesarian faction, meaning he was a supporter of Julius Caesar and his adopted son, Octavian. At the center, we see the implements used by the Pontifex Maximus, the chief priest of the Roman religion. Both Julius Caesar and Calvinus held the position of Pontifex, so here Calvinus tries to connect himself to Julius Caesar, copying a coin design Caesar issued himself. On the legends, we can see the official positions held by him. Domitius Consul Iterum Imperator. Domitius Consul for the second time, Commander-in-Chief. Let's keep going forward in time, to the year 19 BC. The Republic is dead. Octavian, now Augustus, reigned as the first Roman Emperor, and he is determined to finish the centuries-long pacification of the Iberian Peninsula. Augustus established a series of new veteran colonies all over the peninsula, and gave many of them the right to issue their own local coins, but he also installed an imperial mint in the peninsula to pay for his final campaigns against the last remnants of Iberian resistance in the far north. This denarius was issued at Colonia Patricia in southern Spain, and as we will see by this time, coins struck in Spain were basically fully Romanized, with no signs of the old Iberian designs left. On the obverse, in similar fashion to the Denari struck back in Italy, here we have the proud face of Augustus with the legends Augustus Caesar. On the reverse, we have the legends Ob Kiwes Servatos, to the savior of the people of the city, a reference to the people of Rome, or maybe the people from all over the empire, thanking Augustus for liberating them against his political enemies. That's cool, one of the first instances of proper imperial mass propaganda on coins. At the center of the design, we have a civic crown, an award given to Roman citizens for saving the life of a fellow Roman citizen in time of self-crisis. Okay, now let's head to the other corner of the empire to look at another example of Romanization. Let's go to Egypt. Before the conquest of Egypt by Augustus in 30 BC, it had been under Greek control for 300 or so years, first under Alexander the Great and then under the Ptolemies. This dynasty introduced coinage to Egypt, striking coins in typical Hellenistic standard. Here's an example of one of such coins. This is a tetradrachma struck under Ptolemy II. For the tetradrachma, the main silver denomination we have on the screen now, most coins had the same design, with a portrait of Ptolemy I, the founder of the dynasty on the obverse. Looking at the reverse, we can see the symbol of the Ptolemaic dynasty, the eagle, an animal that represented Zeus, a major symbol of authority and power for the Greeks, with the legends Ptolemaio Basileus, of King Ptolemy. When Rome took over, they decided once again not to change the monetary standard itself, meaning they kept the denominations, they kept the weight standards, all metrological aspects of the coins that the Egyptians were used to. It didn't make sense to force a completely different monetary standard and risk destabilizing a system that was in place for such a long time and worked very well in a very profitable province. But they introduced their own designs on the coins. Or did they? Romano-Egyptian coins are very unique. They were clearly Roman in their appearance, but they still display visual elements reminiscent of the Hellenistic period and quite often native Egyptian gods that dated back to the pharaonic period. Let me show you a really cool example. This is another tetadrachma, struck under Emperor Hadrian. On the obverse, it shows the bust of Hadrian, and it's the coin is pretty much in similar to, fashion to what you would find in an imperial denarius, but the legends are in Greek instead of Roman, because, well, that's what people had been used to speaking in Egypt. It reads, Autokratoros Caesaros Traiano Hadrianos Sebastos, which is an almost literal translation to what you could find in a contemporary denarius, which would be Imperator Caesar 
Traianus, Hadrianus, Augustus. But on the reverse, we have a syncretic deity, half Roman, half Egyptian. This is Hermanubis, the mix between the Greco-Roman Hermes, the god of commerce and travel, and Anubis, the Egyptian god of the afterlife. At first, the combination of these two gods might look out of place, but if we consider the, that according to the old pharaonic myths, the dead had to go through a journey, a travel to the afterlife, the connection to a Roman god that protected travelers then becomes perfectly adequate. And here we see this awesome example of Rome adapting and accepting old pharaonic myths into its coinage. Really nice. Here's another fascinating example on how the Romans continued centuries-old Hellenistic designs on their coins. This is another Egyptian tetradrachma struck in the 3rd century, in the year 278 AD to be precise, under Emperor Probus. As we can see on the reverse of this coin, we still have that old Ptolemaic ego making an appearance. It's even striking the same pose as in the Greek coin. That tetradrachma from Ptolemy II I showed you previously, and this one are separated by around 550 years. It would be the same as if coins struck in the United Kingdom today still used designs from the time of Henry VIII. Eagles were very commonly used both on Roman and Greek coins. After all, this was the animal that symbolized Zeus, or Jupiter in case of the Romans, the ultimate statement of authority. But in no province other than Egypt does the eagle show up so frequently on coins. Pretty much every single emperor who had coins struck in their name in Alexandria had one of one or more issues featuring an eagle, probably due to that old Ptolemaic influence. As we go to the obverse, here the Roman coin sadly isn't as beautiful as its Greek predecessor. We have a rather abstract looking bust of Probus with some very simple legends. Autocratoros, Caesaros, Marcos Aurelius, Probos, Sebastos. As the coins struck in the imperial mints started being debased throughout the 3rd century, the same happened in parallel in Egyptian coins, with emperors siphoning as much silver from the province as they could to pay for their troops and their civil wars. These are among some of the very last tetadrachma made, and as we can see by its very coppery appearance, there's basically no silver here, just a testimonial amount. Continuing on, here's a topic I glanced over in the beginning of the video, but I have to go in depth. Rome expanded by military conquest, and much of its success had to do with the highly trained professional army it had. Most ancient armies were composed of levies, that is, when wartime came, people left their usual occupations, farmer, blacksmith, you name it, they gathered at a certain time with their equipment and went to war. Rome had a professional army of full-time soldiers. Professional soldiers were much better than part-time levies, but risking your life for the emperor in a professional way required a salary fit for a professional soldier. After your 25 years of service in the Roman army, you were honorably discharged and you could pick a bonus. It could be a hefty sum of money, equivalent to 13 years of pay, or a piece of land in a newly conquered, in a newly conquered territory, which was a very tempting alternative for many. The constant stream of veteran soldiers finishing their time in service led to an appearance of a multitude of Roman colonies all over the empire. These were, in broad terms, mini Romes in foreign land, settled by mostly Italian, fully Roman settlers. These new settlers, with time, romanized the province they now called home, and they mingled with the local population. As good Romans, they were used to the use of coinage in their typically very urbanized economy, so these new colonies had the right to issue their own coins for their local use. Hundreds of different cities had their own locally minted civic issues, so let's have a look at an example. Here we have a bronze piece struck at Antioch, not the big and important Antioch at the far east frontier of Syria, but a smaller Antioch, called by the Romans Antioch in Psidia, located on modern-day central Turkey. This was originally a small Greek settlement founded by the Seleucid Empire, but as Rome took the Anatolian Peninsula, they settled the region en masse 
with retired legionaries in strategic positions, founding cities in important com commercial routes and establishing outposts in important roads, which was the case in this city here. This Antioch was conveniently placed along the main road that connected the city of Ephesus in the Mediterranean to the province of Syria, a rich and highly militarized area. The proximity from such an important road brought important economic activity to the settlement, which led to the need of its own local coins to support this economy. This coin here was struck under the reign of Claudius Gothicus, between 268 and 270 AD. On the obverse we have this very funny looking bust of the emperor, wearing a radiant crown, just like in his main imperial issues, although the local die engraver was less artistically skewed compared to the main engravers at the main mints, and we have the legends of course, Imperator Caesar Claudius. On the reverse, we have a reference to the original legionary settlers of the city. At the center of the design, we have a Vexilum Legionis, the main standard of a Roman legion, and two normal standards at its sides, showing that, as we previously mentioned, this city was settled by retired legionaries. Next to the standards, we have the legends SR, which most likely stand for Soci Romanorum, an honorary position given to cities that proved its allegiance to the emperor by providing him with recruits and supplies in times of war. Very fitting for this particular city. And finally, around the legends, we have, well, the name of the city, Colonia Antiochia. Notice that the legends are written in Latin, despite the city being bang in the middle of the Greek-speaking region of the empire. That's very interesting. This city was founded originally by Augustus, around the turn of the 1st century AD, and here we are, in the late 3rd century AD. So many generations of descendants of the original settlers had lived and died, yet they still retained their original language, so far from the Latin-speaking part of the empire. Fascinating. Coins give us a fascinating glimpse on how Roman imperialism and Romanization were different. It was a subtle thing that happened throughout generations, for centuries, slowly transforming the local societies into something more Roman. Have you got a coin in your collection that comes from a Romanized region? Let us know in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed this episode, leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel if you did, happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.